This is a short mini lecture to introduce you to some of the ideas around social inequality. Consider this a brief introduction, which you can then use to inform some of your readings or research more broadly on the topic. So in the next few slides, I'm going to try to achieve these three objectives. First, we'll define inequality, explain what it means, discuss the way that social inequality are reproduced, and look at some theoretical approaches for how we can understand inequality and how it is reproduced in society. So essentially, inequality is the way that social structures are produced or expressed or manifested within our social groups. So we've talked before about social structures such as class, gender, or race and ethnicity. And inequality is essentially the way that these structures get played out and people end up in more or less powerful positions. So while a structure itself may not necessarily mean that one person is put in a position of more power, inequality is the result of that structure when power is involved. So if we think about a gender example, when young children are gendered and placed into either a blue or a pink category based on their gender, there's nothing necessarily unequal between the colors of pink and blue. But as that child moves through their life, if they're given different um, rights or abilities based on that structure, this is where inequality comes into play. So the pink or the blue is not necessarily unequal, but when we talk about things like right to vote or own property, then we see how inequalities can get played out. To return back and put this into a bit of a um, image, we can come back to these diagrams depicting equality and equity. So the structure itself, the fence and the ground, isn't necessarily unequal, it's a structure, but it's the way that the distribution of the resources on top of that plays out for the different people that produces an unequal experience. And this is why theorizing differences around equality and equity becomes important. So when we look at society, again, what's important to talk about is the way that inequalities are reproduced. So the way we act on these social structures can or cannot produce inequalities and the way that these inequalities are then transmitted between different groups of people are what produce these inequalities more broadly in a society. So next, I wanna take you through a couple theorists and some important ideas for thinking about how these social inequalities can be reproduced. We're gonna talk about two theorists here and their ideas. First, we'll talk about Dr. Peggy McIntosh, and then we'll talk about Pierre Bourdieu. So importantly, when we're talking about these inequalities, we're not necessarily looking to blame someone. It's not about pointing out the most powerful person um, because often these inequalities are produced in ways that are not necessarily conscious or an act of someone directly trying to put someone in an unequal, unequal position. This may be the case in some cases, but sometimes it's not. And as we go through these, I'm hoping to show some of the ways in which um, these inequalities are produced in ways that aren't necessarily always um, intentional. So first we'll talk about the invisible knapsack. So Dr. Peggy McIntosh was an important feminist theorist who did a lot of work around the idea of race. So she was interested in understanding the unequal experiences between herself and her colleagues who identified as uh, women of color. So even though they were both women in similar positions at a similar institution, she wanted to understand how their experiences could be different. And there's some really interesting videos you can go online and, and read about her experience of thinking through these ideas and the ways that she came to understand her privilege as a series of small daily things that produce different experiences. So she's, she wrote an essay where she listed out over 45 different simple ways that privilege operated in her daily life. So simple from simple things like seeing herself represented in the media or in positions of power or having people take her seriously and not um, judge her based on her, her race or the color of her skin. 
And so what was important here was she got started theorizing about intersectionality and the way similar people in some respects could have very different experiences based on others. Mm -hmm. And the ways that privilege is not necessarily always about these acts of meanness or um, intentionally putting someone else in a less powerful position. So based on these reflections, she developed the idea of an invisible knapsack. And this invisible knapsack is something that you carry around with you. It's a metaphor for privilege more generally. And the invisible knapsack carries a series of tools and maps um, and passports and visas and things that you need to move through the world um, without being necessarily bothered or made feel to feel uncomfortable. So I encourage you to look at the link below where I've linked this list. You can read her essay and you can see some of these different um, ideas that she came up with. And then think a little bit about how they apply to yourself and different people that you may have interacted with in your life. Next we have Pierre Bourdieu. So Bourdieu did a lot of theorizing around ideas of class in society. And he talked about the ways that classes reproduce and transmitted through um, distinctions we make and the tastes we have. So things like the type of food we like to eat, the type of sports we like to play, the leisure activities that we do, or the music that we listen to. And Bridges' writing explained how class structures are reproduced through these tastes that we transmit between different people. So he had a few really important theoretical tools that we're gonna go through now. The first was his different forms of capital. So he talked about social, cultural, and symbolic capital, which all can be used the same way that financial capital could. So social capital referring to the kind of aggregate worth of the networks that we have, so the relationships with different people within our social networks. Cultural capital, um, which in some ways can be equated to education, um, refers to the the skills and knowledge that we have to be able to navigate social relationships or navigate these discussions with different people of different classes. And finally, symbolic relationship refers to things like honor or prestige, so being a person of importance. And Bourdieu discussed the ways that you can exchange your social capital or your cultural capital in order to maintain or advance yourself in a different type of class standing. Importantly, he also talked about this within the context of a, your, an individual's field and habitus. So your field represents the environment or the actors who make up your social environment. And each person can navigate different fields. So when we think about this, we could say our classroom is one field with a certain set of actors where we use a certain social and cultural capitals to navigate. And then after class, we may all leave and go to different places which represent different fields. So some of us might go to hockey practice where we then use different types of cultural capital or skills and knowledge, while others maybe go to a sewing class or a choir where they would have a different set of skills and knowledge that they use to navigate those relationships. Someone's habitus refers to their kind of internal dispositions um, and the, the way that we are socialized and we've learned to um, use these different skills and knowledge. So these ideas of field and habitus were important because they kind of bring together the idea of structure and agency or the subjective and objective parts of the social experience. And this was an important kind of post-structural contribution to sociology. Finally, we have the idea of symbolic violence. So Bourdieu used the term symbolic violence to refer to the process when someone who has symbolic capital, so someone who is prestigious or important, uses that capital to coerce or suggest that someone who has less of that symbolic capital does something that they want. So leveraging your symbolic capital in order to coerce others into a different type of activity or behavior. So one really interesting thing with some of Bourdieu's work is the way it has applied in different leisure contexts. So here we see a graph um, where it's the same, it's three lists of the same type of people. So people who are organized based on their type of work. So roughly associated with their class status. And then we have three different types of music. So each graph refers to a different type of music. And what this shows is that different 
taste in music can be associated roughly with a different class or skewed towards a certain class. So in the, the top graph, we see that people of higher class are more likely to prefer that type of music. In the middle, it's roughly evenly spread, so it's a middle class type of taste in music. And finally, the bottom one is much more skewed towards manual workers and domestic servants. So this could be inferred as a, a lower class taste in music. In some more specific work, Bourdieu plotted different types of leisure activities along different forms of capital. So on this graph, it's quite busy and kind of, there's a lot going on there, but you can see the way that he's mapped cultural capital and economic capital and you can look at having a lot of capital or a little capital and along those two axes. So it's a little bit confusing, but what's interesting here is just to see the way that these different tastes and activities can be plotted against different forms of capital. So you see in the top left-hand corner, you have someone like me, a higher education teacher who has a lot of cultural capital, so a lot of education, a lot of skills and knowledge about culture, but maybe not as much economic capital because I might not make as much money. I'm up there in that um, category with other people like artists and um, you may enjoy things like hiking or, or doing climbing mountains, playing chess. On the other corner in the bottom right, you see people with low, ec or low cultural capital but high economic capital. So people like farmers or farm laborers who prefer things like football. So this is just an interesting example to see how these things can be mapped out. And it really visualizes how you can organize people based on different types of capital. And so an important kind of takeaway from this is that inequalities didn't spring up overnight. They, they grew over a long time um, and developed through these social structures over time. And so similarly, they will take time to change and evolve as they go. What's important with these theories is they help us think about the different processes and how these inequalities are reproduced in society. And because in order for us to change and address inequalities, we have to understand how they're reproduced. So in summary, inequality is the expression of these different social structures in society. And in this brief lecture, we reviewed um, some of the different theoretical approaches that we can use to think about how um, inequalities are reproduced in society. I encourage you to check out the links posted below for some good resources and some further discussion on these different theories and how we can understand inequalities in society.